Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. So, I have finished this book uh, all about ancient Rome. And so, Anthony Everett, he has written some of the, I have a lot of his books actually, written some fantastic things about ancient Rome. And being half Italian myself, I like to learn about my culture, right? This particular section was about Marius and Sulla. And Sulla, man, I wish there was more about him because he seems like a quite intriguing figure. And a lot of people compare ancient Rome's decline to America's today. So I do find it quite interesting to not only compare and contrast, but also to see the trends and similarities and such. Because Rome was such a rich and quite important culture to how the world has unfolded. Now, let us begin, okay? So this one is about Marius and Sulla. In the 80s BC, two great generals clashed. One was respected Popularis, Gaius Marius, who had been victorious over the Gauls. The second was one of the optimates, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. So that's Sulla's full name, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. He's of the optimates, and then Gaius Marius is of the popularis. In 88 BC, Sulla marched his army, loyal to him personally and no one else, into the city of Rome to fight against Marius and his friends. Such an attack was completely illegal and had never happened before in the history of the Republic. Sulla's actions set a very bad example for ambitious Romans in later years as violence among politicians became more common. So here, what I liked was a, lo a, a loyal army to him personally. This has happened in history now more and more. And the Mamluks... I believe, when they were in Cairo, right? The Muslim Mamluks. I learned a little bit. I didn't go full into it. But there was a time when a ruler had his own personal army, right? Loyal to him alone. Genghis Khan, for a time, his army was loyal just to him. You also see this in fiction as well, where, let's say you have Jon Snow, right? Aegon Targaryen, however you want to say his name, or John Targaryen, whatever name you want to put. A group of people behind one leader. Or you could argue how the Unsullied and the Dothraki were loyal to Daenerys. Either way you, you cut it. Game of Thrones was an example of one person having a loyal army, and then those who didn't have the most loyal armies were ones they just paid with coin. So, when we see in history Sulla doing this, we begin to notice that it's not uncommon for a ruler to want his own loyal army. It's just fantastical. When you think about if you were a ruler, you definitely would want that as well. You'd want to have that and when Gaius Julius Caesar had his legions who were very loyal to him people feared him for one of those very reasons because he had the love now today fast forward you had Trump he has a huge cult following people felt that was a threat the Mr. Mean Mr. Mustache he had a huge following loved by the people people who were loyal to him for a time you see, you just start to notice figures in history who they are able to be very charismatic and just somehow they have something about them that attracts people to want to obey them in terms of going to risk their lives for them. One after another, Marius and Sulla staged massacres of their political opponents. Marius soon died old and mad. 
while Sulla had himself elected dictator with the supreme emergency powers. So Sulla, having been quite ruthless, was able to become dictator and had supreme emergency powers. So emergency powers. This is important because during the lockdowns, leaders, mayors, whatnot, were given powers that were not given to them through, some would argue, the constitution or what their job entails. The ability to ban you from going to work, yet demanding you still pay your bills, bankrupting you, shutting your business down. Emergency use authorization to enact tyranny uh, is a problem. And so this is why you'll see some Republicans today really worry about that. And you do see, uh, you know, to be fair, some leftists who are very worried about fascism, right? The fasci. And both of those worries are a legacy of the past from the Roman Empire, if you think about it. There's so much to, that could be said about this, if you just really examine it. Then the bloodletting was effectively legalized. He launched what was called a prescription. He posted in the forum a list of his political enemies who were to be killed without trial. Now, why did the Founding Fathers really focus on a trial? Because they did, they were very well read. Okay, They are very well read for the age. They saw what happens when a dictator can just take you without trial and willy-nilly just dispose of you. They didn't want that. That's why your Bill of Rights, you got your Constitution, they were really worried about tyranny. Anyone who killed a man on the list received a cash prize, so he basically Sulla put a bounty upon his enemy's head. Ruthless. I mean, I wouldn't want to be one of his enemies, but there is just something about that level of force where you're like, whoa. That's crazy. At least 40 senators and 1,600 wealthy men outside the Senate died. So, Solo really made his mark. Really made his mark. I mean, that's like a purge, if you think about it. He wanted to make sure he ruled through fear. He wasn't really concerned with love. He wanted to rule by sheer force and fear. Sulla brought in some reforms to strengthen the power of the Senate and weaken that of the people. So here, from this author's perspective on how he interpreted history, is that really wanting to place it more on the aristocratic senators rather than the people, because in a constitutional republic, the people ideally would send their representatives to vote on their behalf. But then some of the senators started to feel more aristocratic, oligarchical, really feeling that they were of a different class, sort of the wise ones who could come together and dictate down to the people rather than the people dictate up, right? And that is an important thing we should remember. And then in 80 BC, he, retri he retired into public, sorry, no, he retired into private life for a final couple of years of debauchery. He seemed to have had a wonderful time, lying about drinking all day with his glitzy friends. Curiously, when he walked about the city as an ordinary citizen, nobody arrested or physically attacked him. I mean, when you have a certain level of fear, I think that you have an aura of intimidation around you. It takes a very bold person. And back then, they would have uh, really laid into that person if that person didn't do a kamikaze type of mission so the worst he had to endure were the insults of a teenage boy who once trailed him all the way to his house sola put up with this patiently only remarking this lad will stop anyone else from laying aside such power he was right nearly four centuries were to pass before another ruler of rome voluntarily abdicated the emperor diocletian both men suffered from health problems, but they also had a life beyond politics. They believed, as Shakespeare's Coriolanus puts it, 
that there is a world elsewhere. I mean, you could look at it that, but once you've conquered your enemies to such an extent, you get to relax at a certain point because there's not that many vipers in the grass. Most of Solo's reforms were quickly overturned after his death. <laughs> Uh, then with Sack, both he and his bitter rival Marius won power, but failed to make good use of it. There was one sad lesson to be learned from their careers. To its ruin, Rome was getting accustomed to the use of violence to settle political arguments. I mean, when we look at people bickering in the Senate now, and you just see how a stupid riot at the Capitol was called an insurrection, and you compared that stupid riot that did nothing, absolutely nothing besides someone pooped on Nancy Pelosi's desk, and it was just, you know, long story short, but not anything really happened, and Ashley Babbitt, she was one of the protesters, she was killed, so I think that was the only casualty, and then they found out the guard lied, he didn't die because of what happened at the Capitol was something else. And AOC totally lied. She wasn't even in the same building. She totally fabricated the story for likes or whatever. And to see how Sulla took out his enemies like raw, like heads on platters type of energy, you begin to see how the pearl clutching of some, it's really unfounded. It's just morons waving a MAGA flag with a red hat on, compared to what Sola did, he paid people to, you know, he put bounties upon his enemies. You know, people, what do they do now? They make memes and do hashtags on Twitter. <laughs> and the FBI is like, this is dangerous. <laughs> it's just, it's a crazy world. But that's why it's, history is so amazing, because we get to peer into the past, and we get to see what happened before. And see the good of our time and the bad of our time. And so Sulla is a figure that I think is just quite interesting. Let me know what you think. And ancient Rome has so much of a history that I never get tired of reading it. And if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Hope to see you there.